Hi. Uh, so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about a uh, model that we trained or fine-tuned rather for text retrieval. Um, and we're going to introduce the whole process. Just before that, uh, my name is Tom VC. I'm R&D lead on the machine learning team at Elastic. Um, I'm Quentin, and I'm a data scientist at Elastic for almost a year now. OK, so just a very quick overview of the talk. So we'll just talk briefly about how language models are used for um, information retrieval. And then we're, we'll talk a little bit about so, uh, how they've been kind of evaluated now in general purpose settings. So this will be where you'd use, uh, you would have used BM25 before, potentially on unseen corpuses, uh, without fine tuning. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what learned sparse models are and our results on a, an industry benchmark. And uh, then we'll talk about some of the experiences of training the model and things that worked, things that didn't work. Uh, we, we kind of only have time to kind of go into a little bit of the details. And, uh, and then we'll finish up with conclusions and next, what's next. So really just to sort of frame the problem, uh, so we're talking about text retrieval with a user query from a, uh, from a corpus, and essentially there were kind of two, there are two paradigms, I guess, of interest. So there was paradigms that are based on statistical properties of the text in the corpus, so those are things like BM25 scoring, and they use uh, inverted indices, and uh, yeah, and they don't bring in any other knowledge to the, uh, to the corpus. They just they use information that's present in the corpus. And then we've, since the attention is all you need paper, uh, there's been this explosion of using transformer models that learn these kind of semantic representations of language. And initially, uh, those were used in conjunction with fine tuning uh, to bring in knowledge about the corpus to the, to the model as well. And so, the classic benchmark, I suppose, where you saw incredible improvements with uh, these kind of uh, dense models was MS Marco. So that's an open domain question answering setting. And there you have a training data set and a validation data set that you might use for hyperparameter tuning, things like that, and an evaluation data set that's a kind of proportion of the, uh, the, the whole data set that you're using. And so you know, for example, you have lexical similarity, you know, you've got the same vocabulary. Uh, in the tr evaluation data, you have the same broad topics, uh, you have the same qu uh, query topologies and things like that. And so people then were interested in, well, okay, that's all well and good, but I have a private corpus of data and I want to apply these techniques, uh, you know, and ideally I don't want to go through the effort of having to label data or tune a uh, model on my own data set. Um, and in fact, for retrieval, the, the tuning process is quite complex, as we'll go into. So, uh, so they, there was a, a, a 2018 paper, I think, at Beer that introduced this kind of diverse set of data sets that uh, effectively across different domains, different query topologies, and so on. And the idea was that you would then evaluate these dense models that were trained, for example, on MS Marco that were performing brilliantly on MS Marco evaluation. Uh, in this kind of general setting. And generally speaking, they didn't do very well. They like, were worse than BM25. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, there has been several hypotheses to explain why those dense models don't work well in zero shot. So, one of uh, them is uh, because of the interaction. So, right now, when you have a dense model, you have your dense vector for the query, you have your dense vector for the passage, and you have a dot product. And it may be that this dot product is not rich enough to capture all the details of the semantic uh, you need for information retrieval. So, for example, you have cross encoders, which are replacing this uh, dot product with a dense layer for, for ranking. Uh, it works extremely well in zero shot. Uh, much better than the classical dense models. Uh, the problem is that cross encoders, they are extremely slow to operate, you need a lot of, uh, of uh, calculation uh, power, so you cannot use them as first stage retrieval. It's too, too slow. So usually what people do is they use that, they use them on uh, second stage, uh, re -rank as second stage re-rankers. Um, another option is uh, Colbert, which uh, has been 
around for, I don't know, one year, two years. Uh, so instead of having one dense vector per query and per document, you have one uh, vector per token per query and per document. So effectively, what you're doing when you're doing the dot product, it's uh, with matrices. So you can capture a, a lot more of things uh, with that. And Colbert has also shown very good results uh, in zero shot. The problem with Colbert is that uh, because you have more vectors, uh, you have a larger memory and uh, space footprint. So it's a bit more difficult to use uh, in production. Another hypothesis is uh, the middle training. So right now, dense model, when you use them, you are usually starting from pre-trained model, uh, typically BERT. And the objective of those pre-trained model, they are quite far away from information retrieval. Typically for BERT, you are doing mask language models. So you are masking a token and you try to find it back. So even though it's a good task uh, in order to learn semantic in an unsupervised way, it's uh, maybe a bit too far from information retrieval to construct vectors that are good enough for zero shot. So some, some guys in Microsoft, uh, they published, I think it's maybe th three weeks old or something like that, a model called E5, and they totally changed the middle training. So they took the BERT model, they had a middle training step where they, the objective is a lot closer to what we do in information retrieval because they're trying to rank a lot of documents. And the results are really good in zero shot, even though they keep this dot product. So they're probably a mixture of both hypotheses that are true. In our case, we decided to go uh, into the sparse uh, world with a sparse model. So the big difference is that instead of having so relatively small dense vectors, you have huge sparse vectors with typically 30,000 dimensions. So 30,000 is the size of the BERT vocabulary. Uh, and most of those dimensions are zero. So what you're actually doing when you encode a sentence is that you are extracting tokens with weights, as you can see at the bottom. It's uh, quite convenient to see that as some sort of uh, synonym expansion or something like that, as you can see. But it's actually a bit more subtle than that. So you will extract synonyms, uh, of course. But the model is actually trying to, um, to improve the, the retrieval step. And it does what it wants with the tokens. So it happens that sometimes you will extract tokens that are completely unrelated. Uh, but they help the retrieval. And if you try to manually filter those tokens that seems completely stupid, you can clearly see that the model has encoded an information inside, which is not the meaning of the token. Sparse models are quite interesting because uh, as you are storing uh, just tokens and weights, you can actually use inverted index, uh, which is quite mature stuff to use. Some uh, benchmark here. So we use this uh, bare framework that uh, Tom talked about. So various data set, various subjects. We use the metric which is called NDCGAT10. So I won't go in, into the details of that, but uh, NDCGAT10 is just how well you have ranked your first 10 documents. And um, you can see here on those tables two interesting things. Uh, first one is that uh, the Elastic Learn Sparse Encoder, so ELSER, is uh, way above BM25, which uh, was a, a strong baseline for zero shot uh, until now. You don't have here the breakdown, but we are beating uh, BM25 on every data set but one. Uh, another interesting thing is we compared ourselves to OpenAI with their very large uh, model. So I think their model, I don't have the, the exact numbers, but I think it's hundreds of thousands of parameters. And the dimension of the, those dense vectors, it's uh, around 2,000. So it's probably complicated to, to use them in production. And you can see that with ELSER, which is 100 million parameters, uh, we are still competing uh, with them. So uh, we believe that uh, those sparse models are, are quite promising. Uh, last benchmark, um, as you may know, when you have a semantic model, you can combine it with uh, other models in order to improve 
your, your results. Usually you're looking for a model that will make different kind of mistakes. So typically BM25, which is a lexical, it's quite, a, it's quite good to, to merge them. We did that with a reciprocal rank fusion and we get a, a small improvement on uh, what we did. What is very interesting here is that this uh, hybrid LSER is actually beating BM25 on every data set. So that, that we were happy with that. Um, something that is interesting to notice is this merging between BM25 and any dense model. You can do it with various methodologies. One of them is the linear combination. Uh, here, the reciprocal, reciprocal rank fusion is uh, quite interesting because you don't need to fine tune any hyperparameters. So it's like a, a plug and play algorithm. Uh, you, you just use it as is on any data set and you will get a boost. Okay, so we'll just talk a little bit about uh, how we trained this model, so, or rather fine tuned it, I guess we should say. Um, so I guess any uh, machine learning training pipeline has kind of key components. Uh, so one of the data sets that you use, uh, the second is the loss function you use, and the third are the batches. So when you present data to a model, you split it into small batches and you um, compute the loss function over those batches and use those to update the model parameters. And actually for information retrieval, how you present the data in batches is quite critical to the performance of the eventual model. So in terms of the data sets we were using to fine tune, we used a data set uh, which is based on Stack Overflow. So there we took um, uh, question titles and uh, the accepted answer. So we filtered it out to uh, accepted an uh, posts that had accepted answers. Uh, so that's closed domain question answering, but we stratified over about 20 different domains, things like uh, finance, cooking, uh, engineering. Um, and we also used this uh, Google natural questions. So that was an open domain question answering. So that was um, from uh, uh, from essentially web search um, and scraped web results that had uh, manual markup. So in total, there are around about a million queries. Uh, we think there's actually scope to improve things more as you add more data sets. We did see that as we introduced Stack Overflow into the process. Um, and there's also this data point from E5 where they used a very large corpus um, to essentially gain better quality results. Um, uh, but yeah, um, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a fairly large and, and diverse data set. One of the things that's interesting is that the data set isn't fully annotated. So that means uh, effectively you have uh, a tail of potentially relevant queries that haven't been annotated as such. And for classic loss functions, which is contrastive loss, that actually causes problems because when you come to mine examples that you use to contrast with a relevant example, uh, that could actually be another relevant example. But the model will be, you'll te be telling the model that, like, make these two, you know, distinguish these two different things, uh, you know, prefer this response, if you like, uh, which is potentially not appropriate. So following the uh, literature, we use uh, an approach which is effectively a distillation approach. Um, so uh, with distillation, you take us, I mean, they're, they're different flavors. So classic distillation, you take a very large model that you've trained, and it turns out that large models are easy to train for various uh, technical reasons. Um, but, and then you distill it down into a small data set. Here we use this notion of cross-encoder distillation. So Quentin mentioned that cross-encoders uh, learn kind of robust representations of language that allow them to retrieve well out of domain. So we have essentially a setup where we have a query, which is the anchor point, and a positive example and a negative example. And for each, of, for each pair of uh, query and positive example and negative example, we compute a score, which is the relevant score of that doc according to a particular model. So the teacher model uh, and a student model. The teacher model is a cross encoder, and we'll talk about what we did in order to improve our cross encoder teacher. Um, and then the, uh, mo uh, the student model was the model we were training. And uh, so that gives you effectively two, uh, two margins. 
so that's if you subtract the score from the positive pair from the negative pair, you get a margin. And then we difference those margins and square it, and that's our loss. It means a margin means square error loss. It's uh, represented by the area of this square in the diagram. Um, and it's shown to be fairly good, and it, it's robust to these problems of mislabeled data or sort of partially labeled data sets. Um, although there are problems with the teacher quality that we'll, we'll get into. Um, yeah. So, yeah, to use this margin MSC loss, you need a teacher. So, as you said, cross encoders are really good in zero shot, so they are good candidates for, for being a teachers. The, so, what we did is using a mini LM cross encoders. Um, I think it's uh, by Microsoft, and you can uh, actually find um, uh, you can find pre-calculated weights for this cross encoder uh, if you're working with MS Marco. So it was not our case, so we had to recalculate them. Uh, it's quite long, but it's a one-time cost, so you don't have to do it each time you train. You do it once, you store it, then you can reuse them. So it's quite convenient. We decided to have a look uh, a bit more precisely on what this cross encoder was doing on uh, labeled data, and we saw that there were two families of mistakes. So the first family of mistake, the one you, you, you talked about, is that those data sets, they don't have uh, all the positive uh, documents that are labeled. So what you will get is potential negative documents that you will be ranked with a very high score by the cross encoder. And the cross encoder are right. These are very good documents usually. Uh, but as you said, it's not uh, it's not destructive for the training to keep them, so we didn't touch that. We saw a second family of mistakes, which is a bit more problematic. It's when it has been manually tagged as a positive document, and the cross encoder is saying, no, it's not positive. So 99% of the time, the cross encoder is wrong. So what we decided to do is to attach a weight to this example instead of removing them. And this weight makes this example um, not as important as the other triplets during the training. But we asked ourselves if it was not possible to maybe ensemble teacher, uh, teachers in order to avoid having those uh, silly mistakes. The problem is that if you want to do that, you need to find a teacher that will do uh, ideally different mistakes. So you need an architecture that is very different from cross encoders. And this is why we chose to go with Mono T5. So Mono T5 is a generative model, um, very similar in the usage as uh, the GPT-like uh, models. So you give it a prompt, and it gives you an answer. And what you're doing, actually, with uh, Mono T5 is that you will construct a prompt with the query and the document you want to rank. And then you ask for the generative model to give you only two tokens, either true or false, telling you if it's relevant or irrelevant. If you use that as is on Mono T5, it won't work. So you need to fine tune Mono T5 uh, with 10,000 uh, examples. Usually, that's enough. And uh, then what you do is just give query document in a prompt. You extract the logits of the true and false tokens. Then you apply a small softmax function, and you get a score. Uh, when you do that, those Mono T5 teachers, they are actually even better than cross encoder in zero shot. But they are even longer to, to run. So to give you an idea on our data set, it took uh, eight days of two GPUs to get all the scoring. But like for cross encoders, this is a one-time cost. So just want to avoid a bug at this moment. but. Uh, then once you've done that, uh, you're actually, it's not going to work uh, just doing that. Um, the first problem is the scaling problem. Obviously, you have two teachers that are very different. So the scores are not the same. We did a naive uh, scaling of the scores, and it was actually not working. Uh, so we looked at the score distribution. And we saw that it was uh, extremely different between the Mono T5 and the, the Mini LM. 
And uh, if you have distributions that are that different, then you, you are losing knowledge when you during the merging. So what you have to do is reconcile the distribution. So you have various options. Uh, we went for uh, some sort of uh, histogram matching uh, solution. Um, and when you do that, then uh, we got uh, the good results that you've seen before in the benchmarks. Um, we still think that there are um, another problem, uh, but we don't have a solution yet to this other problem. It's uh, linked to the, the interaction of Elser. So when you have Elser, you have uh, sparse vectors and the dot product to extract a score. And actually, this uh, imposes some geometrical constraints to the score that will be uh, in the output. And those geometric constraints, they don't exist with MiniLM and MonoT5. So no matter how long you will train your model, the space distribution of the scores that uh, you have with your teachers is not going to be reproduced by Elsa. And we think that maybe having a, a, an objective like that that cannot be a, a rich is a, is a problem. But as it push the model in the right direction, is not too bad. OK, so, so far we've focused essentially on the ranking task. Uh, when you go to a learn sparse representation, there's another consideration, which is around the efficiency. So, um, uh, yeah, actually in the context of convolutional neural nets for images, there was a regularizer proposed, which is called FLOPS, that tried to essentially um, minimize the uh, cost of computing a dot product between vectors where one of the vectors is represented as an inverted index. So I guess the key thing that you would say is that uh, you really want to vectors to be kind of orthogonal or you want them to use different tokens. You want to essentially spread weight evenly across your token space. Um, and FLOPS captures that as, a, as an objective. Uh, in the information retrieval context, it's very interesting, actually, because it maps quite effectively, we think, to a classic uh, idea of stop word removal. Um, and in fact, it seems to Im promote better representations. So when we tried to remove flops and just trained with ranking objectives, we actually got worse relevance than, uh, than including it. Um, so there's this kind of sweet spot. If you go too far, it costs you accuracy, but there's this sweet spot where it seems to be helping. Um, and actually, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, was lo I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, yeah, and then finally, I just want to cover briefly um, how we're going to, how we, how we presented data to the model, so this uh, concept of batches. So we talked about uh, the fact that you would build, uh, you, you build these batches out of uh, examples of query, positive doc, negative doc, uh, and you have a finite set, and that finite set is determined by how much memory you have on your GPU, essentially, because each, uh, each uh, triplet you add to the batch costs you quite a lot of GPU memory. Um, so you're kind of limited by system constraints into how large the batches you can use are. Uh, but there is other information in the batch that you could potentially use. So we initially were just focusing on, uh, uh, for each query in the batch, just a positive example and the negative example that we'd mined as uh, potentially a good uh, counterexample, something that's uh, lexically similar but semantically different. Um, but you can effectively use the other embeddings that you compute for other uh, documents in the, in the batch to, uh, to work out a margin, an MSE margin, with each query. So you have kind of n squared possible combinations of query and the other docs in the batch as your positive and ne negative example. And you can do that for more or less the same compute cost and no extra memory. So it's like, you know, it seems like a a clear win. So uh, that's, that's what we tried. And we tried it in various forms. Because I would stress that when you train one of these, or when you kind of work on the training side of it, you know, good ideas often 
don't pan out initially, there's some subtlety that you missed that potentially causes the approach to be less effective. Um, yeah, so uh, we started off with our vanilla approach. We then just tried using random in-batch negatives, which is what contrastive losses use. They just construct their batches by taking random queries uh, and then uh, using the uh, docs that you've uh, mined for those queries. The problem with that is when you then try and include uh, the negatives for, or the positives and negatives for other queries as the additional information that you use for each query, uh, they're kind of unrelated. The queries are very different. There's no lexical overlap. You know, it doesn't really give the model a hard task. And so it doesn't really add much to the training process. Um, so, OK. There was actually a paper, I can't remember the, 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 uh, the exact reference, but uh, that proposed quite naturally that you might cluster queries uh, by topic. So you can, use, uh, you can effectively use an embedding model uh, that you then run clustering on, and that will produce queries that are semantically related. And so in-batch negatives for any query is kind of a hard negative for any other query. So in theory, like using the, those uh, negative examples as your additional information for each query could be quite valuable. So we tried that, and it didn't work. Um, and the reason we think it didn't work is that it impacted negatively flops. So the problem with flops, so the way that flops works is that you essentially, um, yeah, you, 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 uh, you find common tokens that are activated in in the batch for different representations, and then you weight those higher, so they cost you more in your loss, so your loss goes up. Um, and obviously, if you have semantically similar queries, you have similar, uh, you have similar uh, docs, and uh, the docs are uh, activating similar tokens. And so you actually, if we plotted out the flops that we were getting, the magnitude of the flops loss that we were getting, it was about 10x what it was what it was when we just used uh, uh, we had no in batch negatives so we thought okay well let's just scale flops and see how that works um, and it didn't work well, it worked better but not still not didn't totally work um, so we had this then this idea that we would try a kind of progressive approach we thought well actually maybe because you know I was saying that flops is a kind of stop word removal process and we notice as well, by the way, that tokens are pruned aggressively at the start. So we, we, we were observing that most of the tokens that were retained for a given representation was, was decided fairly early in the training process. So maybe if we were to use um, uh, uh, random, sorry, uh, we were to use, uh, we, weren't use we wouldn't use in-batch negatives at the start. We'd kind of have this smooth transition where we were taking batches without in-batch negatives and then adding in batches with, with in-batch negatives um, during the training process. And we'd kind of ramp up the proportion where we were using in-batch negatives during training, uh, that that could actually help as well, because we would get the benefits of flops early and then the benefits of in-batch later in the training cycle. And that worked even better, but actually still we didn't quite manage to beat just the basic training. So, I mean, there's always more work and research you'd like to do understanding a problem. We think it might be that we could potentially gain advantages by not just using batch quantities when we're computing flops, but it's not something that we've uh, had time to explore. So um, to, to conclude, as you've seen in those benchmarks, um, ELSA is very uh, strong uh, contender for information retrieval. We really believe that those sparse retrievals, they are intrinsically interesting because of a uh, few, few things, but they are very good already. And I think that um, one of the papers that inspired us, uh, which is called Splayed, is um, not even two years old. So there are probably a lot of work, uh, that a uh, lot of improvement that could be done uh, in the field. Um, we believe also that uh, all those new ideas about middle training that we've seen with Z5 uh, could be compatible with that. So we, we are happy to, to go in this direction. We think it's, a, it's an interesting path. 
And uh, finally, as you've seen previously, uh, we had dozens of uh, bad ideas uh, during this, uh, those last months. And um, it shows that the, the training recipes uh, with those information retrieval models, they are quite mature right now. And um, you, you need to don't uh, underestimate the, the research and development effort you need to put uh, into that if you want to make progress and something that works a bit better than the actual baseline uh, of now. Okay, and yeah, so that touches then on kind of what's next for us. So at the moment, uh, we focused on English language, and um, there are actually some kind of, there's a practical uh, problem that we face, which is getting good, uh, good multilingual data sets, training data sets. And then there's a kind of slightly more theoretical uh, issue with learn sparse representations for multilingual, because the token space kind of is adapted to a particular language. So there's multilingual BERT, which is a larger token space, but it seems like you would probably want some sort of alignment between concepts in different, the same concepts in different languages. So we have an architectural idea that would try and, uh, try and achieve something like that with a sparse model that we want to explore, but it's essentially a kind of combination of uh, looking at uh, essentially multilingual training data and how we can bootstrap that process and also kind of potentially architectural changes. Um, our first version, we just really focused on uh, out of domain, so zero shot retrieval accuracy. Um, and so we didn't try and distill the model. Well, we did try and distill the model in a kind of post-train distillation process, which is very uh, easy to do, but it degraded performance a little bit too much. So we uh, wanted to try quantize aware training which we think is a kind of natural, uh, relatively low effort uh, approach to improving the inference performance. And then the other thing is the index performance. So we were using uh, effectively a rank features uh, a feature of uh, Lucene. And Lucene has this really nice optimization which works brilliantly for uh, BM25 called BlockMax Wand, which is effectively um, it's effectively computing a bound on a score from the block and allowing you to decide if the least good hit you've got so far is better than anything in the block uh, would produce for that query, um, and allowing you, therefore, to skip docs and potentially skip loading documents into memory. Um, and uh, it relies effectively on concentration of weights in some of the tokens. So some of the tokens have to be significantly weight, more weighty than other tokens. And Splay tends to use well ten, tends to use more tokens in the query and uh, uh, perhaps a less uh, a less concentrated uh, rep, uh, weight distribution and so it doesn't work brilliantly with block max wand. We have some ideas on the index implementation side, so maybe using clustering or maybe actually uh, accepting approximate uh, approximate results, which we think is one of the reasons that approximate nearest neighbors actually can be quite competitive with these approaches. The nice thing is that our vectors, so our, the, the number of active uh, uh, tokens in a query is around about 50, we were seeing for typical queries, and for um, docs, maybe 150. So relative to a dense 768 dimension representation, it's still a lot less information that you'd need in, in RAM to, to, uh, to essentially retrieve that document. Um, Contan touched on this idea of sparse uh, middle training. So all of the middle training that uh, approaches that have been worked on are around uh, improving uh, dense representation. So those will be, for example, the average of the uh, output embeddings of a given token, which is what you use to generate the vector that you do your dot product or whatever style retrieval you use, cosine. Um, and we think we can effectively train with a, a, a sparse representation as the uh, interaction that we would then gain more benefits from middle training for this approach. And the last thing is that there have been a few recent papers that have looked at using large language models to uh, essentially provide both training data in domain, so that would be generating candidate queries for docs in a corpus, and also because we saw that you can use uh, 
you can effectively use a generative model to um, create a score. It might be a good candidate for uh, creating a, a third teacher that we could use to get even more accurate scoring in the context of uh, fine-tuning. That's everything we have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom and Quentin. Uh, any questions? But uh, before that, I'll, uh, like, anyone have a question? Raise your hand, maybe. Okay, here I see. I'll give you a microphone in a moment, but I will read an online question first. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Did you evaluate ELSER on domains that were not present in the training data set, which is Stack Overflow and natural uh, questions? Yes, so uh, beer contains data sets that are not in, you know, are not present in there, like it has SciFact and, it, I mean, uh, Fika, Fika I think does use some Stack Overflow, but it also has Reddit, um, it uses Trek COVID, uh, various data sets that are effectively not in the training data. I mean, I would say there is one aspect to that that's kind of interesting, which is if you're doing everything, um, if you're doing everything kind of unsupervised or you're training unsupervised, it's not totally clear to what extent you can't use uh, lexically similar uh, queries or queries or text to uh, train a model, which we think is one of the reasons E5 performs well. E5 probably overlaps beer, but it doesn't really matter. They've kind of have this unsupervised approach uh, that um, learns these kind of uh, uh, good representations that work across a very broad set of text just because they have a very broad set of text in their training data. Like also LLMs, you know, they, the part of the reason they work is that they're trained on the entire internet. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. So my first question is, have you explored multi-fielded search? So when you have not just one field yeah. and you want to combine in some way? So yeah, we did actually um, to see how we would perform on long document, uh, typically, where you would split your document in several fields. So um, what we did for long documents is trying to see what would be the perfect strategy for overlapping and splitting uh, documents in order to, to improve the, the retrieval. Um, we found that with that when you maximize the window and the overlap, this is when you get the, the best results. If you have different fields that are not used for long documents, just, um, let's say, different information. Honestly, I haven't tested it uh, yet, so I don't know what would happen. Um, I've read some papers showing that you have various strategies like min, max, or how to you, you combine the, the tokens. Um, I don't have it in mind right now, but I can share it with you after if you want. But um, there are strategies that are scaling well with the number of fields. This is what I remember. And some of them are going to be extremely bad as soon as you have a lot of field. So it really depends on how much field you have and what you want to do exactly. And a following up question. When you mention hybrid search, so mixing up like lexical BM25 scoring with uh, the learn sparse approach. Uh, so touching around that, learning to rank. Have you explored like ways of integrating actually this course with potentially additional features, like n not related potentially to text, maybe business like kind of features, personalization related features. So how to combine, yeah, this in a sort of learning to rank fashion. So as to consider basically like yeah. your sparse learn model as one of the features potentially and the lexical as yeah. one of the features and then any other features potentially. And that's, I think that will be the approach that we would look at, essentially a re-ranking approach. So rather than trying to incorporate additional features into the language model, we'd probably use the language model in a stacked co context, you know, as an input to another model that we train over that and other features. I think you know, that there's the danger of forgetting when you fine tune on different data. And we would have this worry, I think I would have this worry that if we tried to fine tune a language model representation with unrelated information that we'd actually forget important. Uh, and it's also not really zero shot. I mean, it's difficult to know what features you could use that would be zero shot in that context. Yeah, so I think, uh, and, and they're good 
kind of learn to rank models that are potentially efficient enough to run on the data nodes, say, and uh, give you a kind of reordering, uh, or at the cord and then in your kind of re-ranking at the, at the coordinating node on maybe a very small top end set. Okay. There, there is, yes. Uh, I'm so not the question was, is there any, any support to plans, the, uh, the support for that? For the, the online audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't hear it, yeah. uh, sorry, yes, there, there, there are plans afoot on that, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no more time for questions, but you can go and ask questions to the, the speakers afterwards. Uh, uh, big round of applause for Tom and Kenton. <laughs> <laughs>